Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Zenitsu, and you're listening to the DigiTalks podcast, the show that covers various topics from news to meta developments and everything in between for the fine folks who love the Digimon trading card game. Just as a quick reminder, I do stream this live over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Zenitsu, and it's also uploaded as a YouTube video under the YouTube channel of Zenitsu. Today, I'm with my co-host, uh, Teddy, and we're going to uh, talk a lot about uh, why we see the same Digimon over and over again in card form between multiple different sets. So, uh, recently, we just had the Ultimate Cup. It was Play TCG Ultimate Cup that just happened. I don't have any data on that. There was no preliminary data that was being shared throughout the grapevine. So instead, we are just going to finish off covering the ultimate, or yeah, the ultimate cup from Top Cut, because now we have the full Top 16 and a better understanding on the direction of the meta. So let me just pull that up for you fine folks. So as far as the Top 16 breakdown, we kind of did a little bit of a rough breakdown so now that we know the full extent of the top 16 first place was machine german second place was machine german third place was beelzebon x fourth place was bloom lord fifth was beelzebon x uh sixth place was uh a dorbic otk seventh place was all force followed by eighth and ninth also on machine german uh then we have 10th place on beelzebon 11th on Black War Greymon, utilizing Ragnalordmon. Then 12th was also Black War Greymon, utilizing Ragnalordmon. 13th was Machine German. 14th was Yellow Hybrid. 15th was Machine German. And 16th was D Reaper. So we have a pretty decent spread of different decks. Machine German being the number one deck that was played, and obviously the best of all of these decks, considering it won the event. Then we had three Beelzemons, two Black Wars, and then a decent amount of uh, Tech 1-ofs. Uh, I did a YouTube video. Um, if you didn't watch that, it was a pretty decent breakdown on the BT12 meta as a whole, and I kind of did a little bit of preliminary data on the direction of Ultimate Cups, and it looks like Ultimate Cups as of right now, with what data we currently have, looks to be about the same as most other metas, but that's only like three events into Ultimate Cups, and we still have a lot more Ultimate Cups to go, considering they're surprisingly running more Ultimate Cups than they are Regionals, but I digress, um, and yeah, it looks like Machine German is the best deck of that format. He is leading the pack, not by the largest of margins yet, uh, that could very easily change, but, uh, he definitely is a very strong deck not to be underestimated and underrated at this point, just because as we mentioned last week, and I mentioned in my video, that Machine German just has so many protections, he can build himself very quickly now because of all of the extra efficiency tools, and because of all of the protections that he has, most decks just literally cannot fight against it, and it kind of makes things very skewed, unfair, and at sometimes unfun in Machine German's favor. So I know, Teddy, you just participated in the region, uh, not regional, the Ultimate Cup from this past weekend. So mm -hmm. why don't you tell us uh, firsthand your experience on, well, how you did, your run, what you played against, and your overall thoughts and opinions. Uh, so... Right out of the gate, uh, the deck I played was All Force. I played in the Play TCG Ultimate Cup this last weekend, or well, yesterday, I should say. And uh, let's see, matchup rundown round one. I didn't get to play, um, funnily enough, because uh, Florida decided uh, we were just going to have bad weather, and it knocked out Discord for all of Florida. Super cool, by the way. My internet was fine, but just Discord was just like, no, we don't want to connect to Florida. So I got a round one loss. 
Uh, they dropped me because they just couldn't wait, of course, which is natural. They didn't want to stall the tournament too long. They had already stalled it for about 30 minutes or so. Um, and then about 30 minutes past round one, so I had already got my loss, Discord decided to be cool again. So uh, they let us come back in. Uh, whoever wanted to come back in, they let us do it. So we, me and my Mark I over here, my friend Zach, we came back in and we kept going on. Uh, so excluding round one, uh, I went six and three. So if you discount round one, it would have been seven and two, but that's not what happened. Um, round one, I know who my opponent was because it's just a friend I know. He was playing Beelzemon. Uh so that would have been two Beelzemons I played. I played against another Beelzemon round like six. Uh, I I destroyed him. I was playing all force. It just didn't. There was not much he could do. <clears throat> Every time I would set up a stack, he wouldn't have two clusters in the in the trash. And then even if it did, I was just always making sure I had two Renas unsuspended. It was just not. There was not much he could do. Um, it was a pretty free match. So um, do you? Uh, sorry to cut you off there. Do you oh, think that the limitations <clears throat> definitely helped slow the deck down to make it more fair? A thousand percent. He was still hitting like those like big points, um, and doing all the trashing and stuff. But he just wasn't able to close out games because I would just stall him with all force X, and then I would just come back with the second stack and clap back and destroy him. So like that's literally consistently how I went. I would just rush into all force. Get a body, at least one stack out with arena or two, and then he just couldn't do anything. And round like the first game, I I didn't even give him a chance. I OTK'd him through multiple deletions from his security. It was it was absurd. Uh, game two uh, was a little bit more back and forth, but it was more like he was just rushing me down early. I was digging out pieces, getting all my uh, tamers and then i went into all force and then i won because he just couldn't get rid of the evade blocker multiple evade blockers so i will say if you're playing all force into beelzemon play safe always play safe i promise you it will matter because there was a turn where it was actually the last turn because we were in overtime funnily enough uh or we were in uh time in the round so we were in the last bit of the uh the tournament, the last four turns, my I was starting. I he had four security, or he had two security left, and I was like, I can swing these two security out, but I only have one Rena active, and if I swing unsuspend and it's an option, I lose. So I said, screw it, I'm gonna leave this Rena active, build my second stack, and then while I was building the second stack, I saw second Rena, played the second Rena, won the game there because. He could not deal with the body, the blocking, and the bouncing on his turn. Then when I went into my turn to a swing, uh, lo and behold, there was two of his last cards were deletion removal. And I, so I made the right decision. If you're playing all force, defense is the best offense. I promise you, 90% of the time, it will win you the game. Um, so those are my Beelzemans. I, I, I've, I was very confident in that matchup. There was just no way. More often than not, I win that matchup. So, um, uh, I played against one blue Bloom Lord. I lost that matchup, and it was more like a Bloom Lord court, like turbo. That was all it did. It didn't even like, like the guy didn't even swing with Bloom Lord, like ever. Like he just turboed into all for, uh into uh courts and just won because i just couldn't deal with it or i didn't get my options fast enough to deal with it and that's just how the matchup is if i get into my pieces before him i can control the board make it so he can't play but if he does get into the stack it's kind of just game over because i can't get rid of the courts easily yeah i um, was i was watching uh <laughs> max tapera play uh bloom lord quartz turbo and literally Quartzmon was doing so much more work than any of his other cards. It was just, it was like literally comedic when the opponent was just like, I have zero outs to this Quartz. I think I just auto lose. And then I'm just sitting there. I'm just like, yeah, there, there's no way they could win. They have to have the option to get rid of it, especially if you're all force. That's literally my only out. And I did have two of them in the deck. Didn't see them. And he trashed one when he swung. So, I mean, it was just, it was just no way. 
Uh, I'm fine with that. There's really not much I could have done there. I think I played the matchup fine. I didn't lose 2-0 to the matchup, so I did win one game of that set. But he just, when he found his pieces, he found them all. So I'm not mad at all out of that matchup. I didn't play against any Machine Jaron, which is quite sad because I prepared for that. Um, that was like the reasoning for my deck, my choices in my deck, a lot of the choices in my deck and things like that. So a little disheartened because I was hoping to play against a few at least, let alone at least one or two. I didn't play against any, so um, kind of sucks there that I prepared so hard for like all force red hybrid or not all force uh, uh, machine Jaron, uh red hybrid and bloom those are the three decks i prepared for the most did not play against two of the decks i didn't play against red hybrid or um no, machine Jermon. and i only played against one bloom lord so eh, i guess i can't really complain i did dodge them all throughout my day or they were just in the upper tables and i just dodged them um what else did i play i played against a Galamon player that was just there's just nothing he could do. I, I utterly destroyed him. It was not even close. Um, and I feel bad. He's a super cool guy. Me and him were talking beforehand. But it's just... I get into a evade blocker. There's just nothing he can do. Especially if I get into all four sacks. There's just zero he can do. Like, he just... Oh, I'm going to warp. Okay. Uh, I'll evade. Unsuspend. Bounce your stack. And now he just loses. Because <laughs> he just wasted the tamer to do that. So... Uh, quite an unfortunate matchup. Uh, what else did I play against? I played against... That's one Gallant, two Beelzemans, one Bloom. I played against two Old Forces. Um, that's, what, seven rounds? I played against two Old Forces, and both of them I lost to... But they were very close games, so I'm not mad at all. Uh, they were very good games. Uh, they just played better than me. It's as simple as that. I just made mistakes. Um, and then the last match I played, because round one I didn't get to play, um, the last round I played against was a Minervamon. Like a Mervamon, some weird... It was just not... You don't have the werewolf mode at four. It wasn't good. Um, it was a pretty free match. Not much that guy could realistically do, even with the retaliation guys. It was just, it was game over. Um, so overall, my run was pretty good. I'm pretty happy with my run, excluding game one, because I just didn't get to play. Um, but that's due to outside forces. That's not anyone's fault or anything like that. I am very happy that Play TCG did let us come back in after the people dropped and things like that. Because I won't fry it, it left a sour taste in my mouth. I was like, well, I'm a little disheartened. I don't get to play and I practiced super hard for this tournament and now I'm just shit out of luck because Florida decided ten minutes before the tournament started, we're gonna mess up the tournament. We're gonna mess up Discord for you. So, yeah. That it's sucked. It's cool that you dodged a lot of your bad matchups because, like, the meta is determined by literally the top dog and how likely you are to see him and what is able to form around that top deck. Because uh, as a red hybrid player, uh, I would think with Machine Dramon being the best deck and Black War Greymon still being pretty good, uh, even though he loses a lot of his defensive tools, uh, it's... I played against that, too. Yeah, Black it's Warrior. it's still a deck Red Hybrids would struggle with just because it has some immunity to deletion and big enough blockers at times to be able to, like, try to wall you out. I don't think it's as bad as, like, base game, like, competitive game, but it still can be a struggle because they could still use a lot of their tools, even though it's a little bit more limited. But uh, I think that Red Hybrids is like borderline almost unplayable if Machine Dramon keeps climbing in terms of popularity and presentation. There's just no possible way, unless a Red Hybrid dodges literally every Machine Dramon, 
that they could even have a chance to to see the top tables. And yeah. and that's kind of where like I think having like a understanding and idea of meta diversity is something that some people aren't necessarily aware of because they're not looking at all of this data like I am and compiling it. I don't know if Eggman has his own metrics on what he considers a good meta, but based on the data sets that I work with from his data, I think that the top deck representation, if it's 35% or under, then it's kind of in the healthy range. It's like an acceptable level of high. Uh, I usually want to see probably about 25 to 30%. I think that's more reasonable, but 35 isn't that unreasonable either, as long as there's multiple different decks that are still able to top. So in previous metas, we have had like lots of decks be able to top. The healthier the meta, the more is actually able to top, which then creates a more diverse representation of what's allowed for people to play. And then we don't see the same like three, five decks over and over again. And that's when the game gets boring and stale. And I think like 15 decks that are able to top is a pretty good range. Anything that's like in the 13 and under, I would say is not necessarily super healthy, especially the higher the representation of what the top deck is. So we're coming out of a format with Beelzemon being at about 43% and like 12, 13 playable decks. I would say that's not a very good meta. Uh, the worst meta in recorded history right now, excluding Block Zero, because Block Zero, the game is still trying to find itself. It's still building upon the foundations and the mechanics that it's setting out, and the card pool isn't exactly there to allow diversity. But starting with like Block One, BT7 is still the worst meta with 11 playable decks and blue hybrids being 55% of the top. So that's kind of like where I'm coming from in terms of like what I'm expecting to see out of the average meta and what I define a good meta. The lower the top decks representation is and the more decks that are able to top, the better I think that the meta is as a whole. I can agree there to an extent. I don't know. I mean, I think anything over 10 decks is not the worst. No, it's not bad um, compared to other games. It's just compared to Digimon where we're coming from Melga format where it was like EX3 and BT10 mostly. Melga being the top deck was only 25% and there was like 20 different decks that were able to top. Uh, then we have BT11, which was uh, Black War Greymon. That was about 34% representation. And then in terms of deck diversity, there was like 18. Yeah, it gradually got lower as we get better and better sets. And when BT11 was fixed, it it literally, the, the amount of decks shot up because of the fix. So again, we saw the lower representation on the top deck, which was still uh, Black War Greymon, but it wasn't right. as high. And 25 decks were able to top in BT11, which is absolutely crazy. I think that's the most decks that we've had able to top. And even BT9 with Alphamon dominance, that still was, again, only about, like, 25-30% of the top. And there was around 20 it. decks able to top. You know, I... Okay, I can see that. You know, I understand. That's definitely... uh. That definitely makes sense, and I think, uh, I guess because I come from other games that you, that you don't you don't get that luxury ever in some of these other games, uh, i.e. Yu-Gi-Oh and things like that. Um, there's seeing more than five is just a breath of fresh air to me, to be hundred percent honest. Um, now, mind you, that's just an anecdotal thing specifically to me. Um, and I like that Digimon does have that that ability that we still do have. At least we still have at, a little over ten decks that are able to 
get to those top tables. But I can see from your end where if we're going just by Digimon standards, uh, it's definitely a little more concerning that we've gone from even just one set ago. Half the amount of decks are able to participate is definitely a little uh, a little indicative of what's happening with card design. I don't know if that's just purely that or if it's just the player base like now we need to consolidate uh what decks are good all right anything that's not good we're not playing or if it's just and that just the card design is like well there's no reason to play those other decks when these decks are good um i don't i don't know where that line is so i can't say i'm going to make the assumption that it's probably just because we're a little more on the competitive side and the NA side, at least where we want to play whatever's going to win us the game easiest. That's just how NA is. Um, and we'll tend to lean towards those a bit more. So maybe that's why the deck diversity dips so hard. But part part I of it. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry if I was interrupting you, but um... you're good. Part, part of it fed into our conversation last week on what we define as a good deck. So this is kind of like leading into it where it's like we understand what makes a deck good and how good the deck is compared to the other decks. And if there's responses that other decks have to be able to compete, like that's something that's really, really huge on being able to have a diverse meta spread. Like a lot of the decks in some of these formats are kind of, I got lucky and I was able to top with this. I don't reasonably think that many others would find that same level of success, but the fact that it did have some success in my books is something actually noteworthy because it shows that there is something at least there to think about grasping at to try to come up with your own level of success. And a lot of us just look at the, the winning deck, the top number one deck, and we're just like, that I want to copy because it worked for them, so it should work for me. Uh, that's not going to be the case 9 out of 10 times. But, um, yeah, like, that type of self-fulfilling prophecy where we just want to play the winning deck or, like, what is at the best in top of the meta is part of what feeds into how our meta gets created and formed. And we are picking up some pieces from... The Japanese data as the first initial thing to grasp onto that we can see. Sometimes metas line up where we do have more of a one-to-one, -one, and then sometimes the metas don't line up where we kind of have to be creative on the differences between us and Japan. Interesting. You know, that's a good way to look at it, honestly. We, because we can't just go blanket by what we see on Japan, because a lot of times we, or at least uh, I'll just say the NA audience, because I'm not part of that, but sometimes, because I play a lot of different decks, but um, we do tend to optimize very hard. So I'm, I'm interested to see what happens going a little bit forward, because... Um, now we're we're heading into ex4 right ex yeah, yeah we're going to be hitting ex4 i think it's like literally in a week or two next week next, next week, yeah. week good thing i talked or to my this store this week coming up yeah good thing i talked to my store and reminded them i was just like hey um when's your pre-release for bt13 and by the way do you have an update on my order for uh ex4 and they're just like we'll get right on that and i was just like thank you store this is why communicating with your LGS is always a good thing. Yes. Support your local game stores. Please. They, they, they could keep us alive. Keep the game going. Never hurts. Um, but I'm, I'm interested to see what happens going forward. If we're gonna, I, I assume it's probably going to just be more of the same. I don't think we're going to change too much because the X4 doesn't really change very much. No, uh, we'll just to, a couple. It's an extra rogue deck. And then, yeah, it's like blue flare updates. But yeah. other than that, I don't, I don't really see much changing either. Cause I think in Japan, I don't remember when Rising Winds came out, but like that 
had it some in changes. The middle of it, right? Yeah, like they they had some it's... like really rapid fire releases where it's just like sets kind of blurred between like Rising Winds, EX4, BT13. It was literally like back to back to back shotgunned for them. Uh, it's not as bad for us. EX sets are always going to be pretty bad because of just the separate release cycles and how they line up. But I don't think Bandai is ever going to fix that, unfortunately. But sure. regardless. Their their data is not necessarily the most reliable going into our even BT thirteen. Their data isn't one hundred percent reliable because they had rising winds by BT fourteen. So they had they it actually had, before BT thirteen. Yeah, or <laughs> BT thirteen. I mean, but it it goes to show that they had cards in their environment that we currently don't outside of just. A handful of promos like there were literal decks that may have Available. not had the greatest of impacts but still had some impact on the card choices and decisions that we have to think about when building our decks preparing for our own metas so this is the point where we're not on parity what do we do so we're just going to continue what we have been doing for the most part and i don't see blue flares being number one it might nah. bump up a tier, maybe. It, it starts to get a little bit more independent on the opponent not needing stuff, which is good. But yeah, the jamming and the extra draw power, I, I like it a lot. Yeah, Dark Nightmon might actually be a thing. It depends on how the meta shapes up. I don't think there's actually a reason to play Dark Knight if Machine Dramon exists, though, because they're doing some very similar things. Let me just create a blocker or, like, let me just have an unkillable Digimon and always have a Digimon presence and just wall my opponent out. And Machine Dramon just does that way better. Uh, so... Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, like, I don't think that's a question like, or a debate. The, the Machine Dramon just easily walls a lot harder than Dark Knight. Yeah, because I played uh, my store championship this weekend. I was not expecting to play in it at all, to be 100% honest. I literally just went to that store as a meeting point to sell some really expensive cards. And, like, they were expensive Digimon cards to somebody. And I was just like, hey, uh, are you guys running a store championship, by the way? And they're just like, oh, yeah, that is today. And I was just like, because I was not sure because of the uh, Magic the Gathering pre-release. And I entered with Red Hybrids, and it was five rounds. I went three and two. My losses were to the second place Red Hybrid Mirror. Okay. And then the first place Machine Dramon, those were my only losses. And I was just like, okay, Machine Dramon is definitely this deck's... It's it's almost comedic on how bad that matchup is for red hybrids. Just because it can't close out the game. Yeah, and I saw a Dark Knight player get into top tables. And he was playing against the red hybrid player that uh, beat me. And the red hybrid player was struggling just because he couldn't close out games because the Nene would create blockers and then you'd have to figure out a way to get through three Digimon spawning one after another. And you only have so much limited deletion in red hybrids that like if they just have a board, you it is a fight. It is a stall fest. It is you're you're not in the hot seat. But, You're definitely playing more on the back burner more often than not. Yeah, it it Dark Nightmon is definitely going to be a pretty good rogue deck, and then the only other deck that's noticeable like no, noticeable in EX four is the Omnimon deck, and that's because it's doing like it has the potential for the speed and it has the potential for the protections to be competitive. It's just right now the unknown anomaly on how many people are going to pick it up and how good the deck actually is in the landscape versus everything else. So I would label that as like my rogue pick. Yeah, I think it'll be fun to play. I just don't know if it'll be that great. Um, at least right now, there's still a bunch of things that the deck will be getting in the future, like uh, our boy, our friend here, Al Guy D. Cisawai says, promo to Skull Knight. Those we do get that a little bit later. That's 
Well, I guess we don't know when that's happening. We know it's going to happen after BT13. It's but... I think it's BT14, but regardless. But that's way later in the game. That's not something we even need to think about for a while. So it's uh, it's good to have in the back burner, but not necessarily uh, going to affect our minute coming forward. So uh, uh, what place did you get in the Ultimate Cup? I don't know if you made that announcement or not. I got exactly 100. Oh, uh, that's so that's pretty dope. 20. So, I mean, it's a cool number, so I guess I won't be mad at that. Yeah. Um, Out of the uh, 18 people at my store championship, I got sixth, mostly due to tiebreakers. And I don't know. I was... I already wasn't expecting to play in that store championship, and after playing in it, kind of getting my feet wet into post Beelzemon, like post ban list. Nerf. Yeah. <laughs> post ban list changes. I was just, I still wasn't having fun. I, it's something about this format. It's, it's just very, very polarizing. And I was doing some practice against machine German because that's obviously red hybrids worst matchup. And honestly, if machine German gets a boost in people playing it, I might be like literally forced to drop red hybrids just because I don't want to play against one of the more prominently played decks. Like I have a good hunters matchup, but I have a terrible um, machine German and black or Greymon, which are, which <laughs> is positioned to be the number two and number three decks respectively. So it's just like I can beat the number one, but I can't beat the number two and number three. So if that puts me at number four, am I still worth playing? Like those it's, it's really weird trying to get a read on the meta. And like, that's, that's the interesting part going into events is how do you prepare and how you're going to be able to get a read on the meta. But I know that this weekend uh there was a well it's not really just this weekend this week there we were getting what more we were finishing off the bt14 reveals and yep. i know that a lot of people are complaining that uh there's another set with another agumon and the agumon is actually really really good even though the rest of the line is kind of mid the fact that it's still like it's still one of the best decks in japan and it's getting more support that is actually good. It it really is starting to put a sour taste in people's mouths. And I think that they... I don't want to say, like, they don't understand what's happening. They, they do understand what's happening because other card games use their primary characters more than most other cards. But I think to the level of why and the frequency might be something that... Uh, some people might not be 110% aware of. So this goes into how Digimon is designed in terms of like set design and card design. They design based on the theme of the set and the lore that they're pulling from. So that's kind of where things tend to start to get made. So because Agumon is a very prominent character in literally every single Digimon media, it is almost a no-brainer that we're going to be seeing a lot of the character. So, like, I don't necessarily hear a whole lot of Dragon Ball people get upset that they have the 117th Goku. Uh, this time, the Goku is Goku, OG Goku, and he uh, is just introducing, like some more Saiyan support. Uh, I'm, I'm just speaking hyperbole out of my butt. Like I don't, I don't see Dragon Ball complaining that there's another Goku. Like it's obvious that there's going to be another Goku because he is the main character. He is the star of the show. He is it literally in almost everything. And like, that's Agumon for us. I'm not going to sit there and say, Oh, One Piece is going to expect to never see Luffy for three whole sets. No, Luffy is going to be in almost every single set, whether you like it or not. And it just is up to the designers to figure out a way to make the character feel different each time. 
based on the lore that they're pulling from and the different colors that they could be playing with. Because in one set, we've seen Agumon be green because of Taiga. And another set, we've seen Agumon be red because of Tai. Then another set, he is black because of Yuya. So, like, the different characters do have an influence on what the Agumon is trying to do and the support that it's trying to give. And I think, like, part of the problem is they have made a lot of the Agumon support cards just generic Greymon tech. And the Greymon deck as a whole has just homogenized into this amalgamation of the best Greymon cards dot deck. And that is the problem that people are actually having. Yeah, that everything is just too generalized rather than it being like, this works specifically for the Yuya line, this works specifically for the Thai line, this works. They didn't separate it, they just said, well, this search is Greymon. And then Omnimon, or I, I, E, whatever, ever, X, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, we have this, like you say, amalgamation of just pure Greymon support. So anytime any good Greymon support comes out, it just gets tossed in. And it's just this constant wave, and we're always going to get Greymons and Omnimons. That's just how it's going to be. Um, it just makes sense. Um where I, I guess I find fault in it is that we do have, there's, I guess in terms of Dragon Ball, it makes sense that like they're going to have um, like Gokus and things like that. But there's not that many characters in Dragon Ball. So it's like their list to pull from uh, that are at least worth looking into, is what I should say. There's plenty of characters, but they're not really like, like, are they, do they really care about Farmer with a shotgun? Like, over Goku, like, so it's like, there's not that much to, to pull from. Whereas, like, Digimon has a lot of different Digimon, like, and it, it, Agumon just happens to be a protagonist Digimon in a lot of different protagonists. But it's not, it's not like there isn't a wealth of Digimon to pull from, and I guess that's where people have grievances. Um, aside from the fact that. Every Greymon support just supports itself, which is another problem all on its own. Um, I think with the different characters, they are doing a little bit better of a job. Like, Marcus's Agumon doesn't necessarily play the best with a lot of the general Greymon support. Especially, like, the new... Type. Yeah, especially the new way that Marcus wants to play for his deck. Kind of, is it shaped how the Agumon can be used. Like, I've seen people tech in that Agumon just because it's another decent generic searcher. It can still digivolve on top of Koromons because who cares about colors as long as your names match with a lot of these alternative evolution costs, which I think is its own separate problem, but that's for own like a completely separate discussion. But mm -hmm. the fact that you can't, you don't just want to throw in generic Greymon support just because it's generic Greymon support when the rest of the cards don't support it. So you can't just expect to throw in BT12 tie into the Marcus Shine Greymon deck, even though tie works with Greymons, the Agumon line that Marcus works with doesn't work with tie. There is no way to play that card efficiently in that style of deck. Uh, same thing with like Nokia. It's a good generic tool, but again, that's where the design of the cards kind of come in and say, okay, you could do this, but it's just not going to be the greatest because you don't have the tools to be able to make it efficient and you'd be making your deck slightly less efficient by using it. Yeah, exactly. So I think like if that's... they lean harder into that aspect, then I think people would have less issues because like, Looking at BT6 Akumon, it's specifically playing with the warp, uh, or not warp, with Agumon Bond of Bravery. It's inheritable to yep. this absolutely nothing for every other thing. You could, sure, use it to play your ties for generic Greymons a little bit more efficiently, but if that's the only thing the card is good for, I think there's just, you could get better mileage out of a different Agumon. Yeah, exactly. I think that's where we 
have a little bit more, I guess, issues with. Because I look at, like, some of these other Agumons, and it's like... Like, if I look at just a generic list, if I were to pull up a random list right now, I guarantee I can guess at least three of the Agumons that are being used. I guarantee it. 100% right now. I can pull up a... Uh, I'll do it right now, actually. Let's do it. I'll go ahead, and I guarantee I'm gonna I'm going to say them, and then I'm going to pull the list up. So... This is going to be, let's do, uh, we can do BT5 Agumon. We can do uh, Promo Agumon that gives the 2000. And then Agumon X. Let's see. I'm going to pull up this random list from Ultimate Cup. BT5, Agumon X. And this guy's running BT12 Agumons <laughs> and different. So a split of the BT12 and then a split of the bt5 so that's you see like right there that's it's just like these are just generically they're too generically good like in every single graymon deck like i guarantee if i look at the other guys list it'll probably be damn near the same uh he basically the same exact thing the only thing different is he's using bt12 agumon the yellow red one he's using two of those so he could get Marcus, because he has Marcus in the deck for some weird reason. Uh, I mean, it worked. So I guess, I guess, it, I guess it's for memory manipulation, so he can get bigger with the Ragna. Okay, I like it. I mean, but, but... Re regardless of what he's using, he's just using generic Agumons just because of the name-based synergy. Yeah, the the well, not only do they search, but they do other things with Inheritables, and they're just generic cards. They're not specific towards something. And I think going forward, Bandai needs to start making, when an archetype is over-supported, more specific cards. So I don't think that any deck outside of the Omnimon deck is going to be running Agumon from EX4, because okay. that Agumon more specifically works only with the way that the Omnimon Alter S deck is even designed to play in tandem with Gabumons and Garurumons. So they need to start leaning more into that and less into just, hey, this is just a generically good card that works for literally everything and there's no reason or downside to run it. So, and like either that or they take the secondary approach and just make the card strictly weaker. So we have seen that the, uh, not to get super far ahead, but based on Japanese spoilers, we know BT14 what the Agumon does. It's another really good generic Agumon tool. And the War Greymon is not going to be as good as the BT-12 Greymon. So I think that's kind of where good design starts coming into play, where it's like they're trying to do something very, very similar. It's just BT-12 is significantly better at achieving the same type of a goal. It's just that... The new War Greymon is trying to play off of the new stuff, which is trying to be its own thing, interacting specifically with ties and the mechanics that Ty from BT12 is trying to play with, which is Raid. So you you do start to see that they are trying to separate the stuff and the decks, but they need more time to be able to do that. And I really hope that's the direction that they start leaning things into. Uh, then you get stuff like Garurumon, where he just gets completely color shifted. So like, I based yeah, on now. <laughs> yeah based based on the starter deck for what starter deck fifteen and sixteen Garurumon yes. stops being blue and now he's back to being purple. Uh, so going into BT fifteen, I think that they're going to could they're going to have a blue and a purple uh, Garurumon. Because we see with BT14 that there is red Agumon stuff. Is there any black Agumon stuff? Uh, the starter Not deck was B black. So, yes, the starter deck is specifically black. Yeah, so they're they're going to, like, they, they flip-flop between how they want to support and what. And this is kind of where I think name-based synergy and, like, dual-color cards become a little bit on the dangerous side, uh, is the fact that, like, you could end up where colors don't matter, and then that's the scariest part, 
is when they actually don't. There's already a very like thin line as is because of name based evolution and dual color cards. But I think right now they're handling it very tastefully on how that they're approaching it. I as think as we see with Ultimate lane. Cup. I think those starter decks, like 15 and 16, are leaning towards the side where I don't like. Because they don't, they just evolve over a specific name. Like, Agumon just can evolve on top of any Goro. Um, Greymon can evolve over any Agumon. Like that. So it's like, I don't, I don't like that. You, what you need is more of like Geo Greymon, where it's more specific in what it's looking at. Where it's just like it's yeah. not just any Agumon; it's a dinosaur Agumon. So uh, it has to but, be a black Agumon or something, something specific like that that makes it a little more right. Because we saw the, with EX Four, there was Metal Greymon that is specifically asking for Blue Greymon. So we know that before Blue Flares was playing the starter deck red Greymon just because it generically gives security attack plus but now the new blue flare metal Greymon can't use that card because it's specific it, it's more specific so i think even though it could be a little bit more wordy on the cards they do have to make the special evolution conditions more specific i, I think they need to have more restrictions because like literally the whole line doesn't matter they just evolve over the line so like the black metal gray or can just evolve over any Greymon level four. It, it, it's just Greymon in name. So it's not even like specifically Greymon. It just says Greymon in name. So it could be Greymon X, could be any of those things, which is a problem because it's going to be hard to future proof these or like um, balance them when they do make better Greymons and things like that, which these Greymons are actually really good from the start. Of work. Like they're, they're actually very absurdly good. Um, so but, it's like, eh, yeah, I don't know but, how I feel about it. but going back to like the main topic on why we see so many Agumons is because of the lore and where he is. Because you have Tai as an Agumon protect, like his he he is the protagonist of the show, and his Digimon partner is Agumon. Tai is also seen in O2 as a supporting character, but hey, there there is Agumon again, and in O2 there's even a black war Greymon, so like you which is in the agumon family and evolution line then you have the uh adventure tri movies which again features agumon with a aged up tie like we've seen on all of the different tamer cards and the different incarnations of these tamers the different versions of the character that they go through and their different ages that they appear in so we have just already a slew of characters that already was represented with Agumon, and as long as they go back to those types of, like, settings, then we could reasonably expect that there is just going to be another Agumon, or for various other characters like Garurumon or Tentamon, or you name it, even, like, uh, Rosemon is just another one, where it's just like, Rosemon is the mega to two different characters from two different seasons. So, you could reasonably expect... That when we see Mimi, we should see a Rosemon, and when we see Yoshino, we should also see a Rosemon. So, like, we can't necessarily get away from seeing the same character be repeated based on what they're pulling inspiration from. Of course. Um, my caveat to that would be... Oh, I guess where I, a lot of people have those grievances is that there's plenty of other media to choose from. Like, we, there's plenty of other Digimon that aren't part of those groups. Of course, those are the more recognizable groups, so they're probably going to pick off the more recognizable groups more often than not, just because if you see Agumon, it's, it's Agumon. So you'll see it, you'll be like, okay, or a lot of people gravitate towards it, probably should buy this product because I like Agumon deck. I like Agumon.deck. Greymon.deck. So it makes sense in terms of the business aspect. But I guess we a lot of people, including myself, are on that point where I want to just see different Digimon. I want to see 
all of the Digimon encompassed in the, the card game. I mean, you're Since... you're not wrong. We have over 300 rookies alone, and there's like over 4,000 Digimon that they could pull from. And it's like, there's there's plenty of media for it. Like, I know that. We have manga stuff. There's plenty of other shows that we still haven't seen Digimon for. I mean, Crosswords, we still have a bunch of Digimon we haven't seen from there, like the Shoutmon forums and things like that. There's uh, the games, Arcadiamon, and all these other things that we haven't seen. Uh, well, he technically is from old manga, but I, aside, diff, uh, tangent, different I thing. mean, even um, as recent as Survive, like a Survive-based set would be sweet. Yeah, uh, even Mom, though, Yeah, like, even though there is an Agumon cool line in there, the fact that you have the different uh, branching, branching paths evolution. of the story means that they could revisit they could the character. They could make a very unique deck yes. with that. Yeah, uh, like you could have literally a Harmony deck where it's just like, here is the protagonist and the harmony route line and support that then you could have a wrathful like a wrathful deck or like just figure out a way to encompass like they're they've been really good at encompassing lore and the flavor of the digimon into card form uh i've said this multiple times in previous videos past like lord nightmon was a really good example on how it interacts with Lusamon. Same thing with uh, Dynasmon. And that's still reflected even in the new Lord Nightmon and new Dynasmon that they still want to interact with Lusamon, even though they're designed for the Royal Knights deck. Like, they, they're dipping their toes into how we could try to incorporate as much lore into the card and make it as flavorful as possible while still being a, you know, card a that we can play. Like a useful card. Like, it's not just a dead card. So yes. I, I, I agree very hard there. They're, when it comes to flavor, they do a, an amazing job of just incorporating the lore very heavily into the card. Which is dope. That's not a bad thing. Um, it can be, but it's not a bad thing more often than not. But uh, not, not every set is focused around Agumon. I know with the theme of EX5 revealed, it is a beast-themed deck. My we are time. going to see... Yeah, we're going to see the Sovereigns uh, finally get the their day in the spotlight. They've had incarnations. They had pretty decent incarnations, but they, they weren't like, oh, this is dramatically uh this this is a playable card i think a zulongmon from bt6 was like the strongest one bahuman mm. from bt9 was pretty okay as just a generic black card but that's when we weren't really looking at generic black cards yeah and a zulongmon did get phased out in the deck that it was ran Very in quickly. which was blue hybrids for mirage galgamon because it's just it's doing a better job at controlling the field which is what blue hybrids was trying to do at the end of the day not have this like big unga bunga aggro card but we didn't have mirage at the time so we just had to play with what we had and it wasn't bad because decks back then were swarming more often than not and it was just a good card for that right yeah. and that's like beasts is going to be the theme of ex5 which isn't going to have an Agumon. We know that with BT-15 being a continuation of more Seekers support and more Adventure support from the stuff that we haven't seen in the OG Adventure stuff that BT-14 was introducing, there's there reasonably should not be a, a Agumon in there unless Agumon somehow appears in Seekers, which I don't think he currently does. I could be no, wrong, but I don't think he does. Not in the current, uh, the last chapter, at least. He has not shown up, so... I mean, Seekers is uh, Seekers is moving so painfully slow. It is. It is, uh, we definitely need to pick up the pace a little bit. It doesn't need to go incredibly faster, but just, just a bit. Because I want to know the lore behind Fenrir Lugamon and how ag gets there and then i also want to know the lore behind the eventuality of fenrir lukamon takami kazuchi and how the heck that unity happens 
and yeah, what, like yeah, how do we get to that point uh, right and Lord. and it's just like oh now i have i'm not caught up on seekers but it's like they spent like the first five chapters just literally getting ag into the office to learn about digimon and it's just like yeah. or like not really learn about digimon but get his actual like the partner we know uh as lukamon it did take a little bit longer than I'd like for him to just start. I could have understood maybe an episode or two of them, you know, getting him more accustomed, learning about what they are, then giving him in the first, like, one or two episodes. But then, like, it was almost six episodes. It, was on, it wasn't until, like, the middle of that episode and almost the end of that episode that he, like, actually gets his partner and then... He's but actually doing stuff with that. <laughs> it's like uh... which which is where like the lore aspect of the card is kind of losing me because I haven't spent enough time with the character and with the Digimon to really understand the lore behind the effects that they're trying to implement because we could see with the Agumon from BT14 that it has a warp ability. Well, that's because in the TV show, the OG adventure show, that Agumon towards the end of that show literally warps quite a lot. Um, so, like, it it makes sense that the... Uh, well, it's not on the Agumon, it's on the Warbraymon. Yeah. It's, it's on another card, but we could see, like, the ideas that the lore is giving and feeding into the mechanics. And I I do really love that aspect, not only just from the art, because they have a lot of, like, lore and flavor hidden in a lot of art pieces as well, but, like, that's, that's kind of the general gist on why we see the same stuff over and over again, is because the more lore a character has, the more incarnations, iterations, mechanics that they can give it based on said lore. And the less lore that we have to work with, the obvious less room for them to make interesting things for. So that's that's kind of like where things are with why we see as much of the same Digimon as we have. And I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. They could, they could actually just choose to start... Uh, like we said, implementing harder restrictions when it comes to some generic support for heavily supported archetypes. And then they also could just start designing the card to work not in tandem with what we currently have and try to do something new and interesting that we haven't seen. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'd, I'd have to see because that would be very interesting to see what they could do and the thing is there's plenty of options like there's there's a lot that they can do and we've seen it with even in just looking at like bt13 with the how how interesting the royal knights deck is and how uh the blast evolution or the yeah the blast mode evolutions they're very very cool and the thematic i love it the working in tandem with the tamers i think it's super super dope so i'm I'm hopefully optimistic that there's there's going to be some cool stuff coming uh, just up the line. So I'm I'm very interested to see what happens. Yeah, look, I'm I'm just in pure copium that I'll eventually get a good Leomon deck. Like, please, Bandai. Um, uh, good luck with that. <laughs> I good luck he with has that. some really interesting lore and character development and. <laughs> He just doesn't have a deck. He he. They are trying so hard, but they need to be more consistent. Like Leomon is a perfect example where it's just like we have seen Leomon several times, and none of it has been working in any form of coherency with trying to make a semblance of a deck. Because you have Leomon in yellow, you have Leomon in blue, you have Leomon in green, and. None of them are interacting or playing with anything each other is trying to do. It's really sad and really funny. And like, if they start implementing that more towards some of the overused stuff, like, I think people would be complaining a lot less. And they uh, still have room so. for 
more Digimon and obviously with any bans or restrictions or limitations and just the want to update decks that people are currently playing and already are established like that's kind of like not necessarily forcing them to go back but another incentive for them not to use more Digimon than they currently are and I think that's like the beauty of EX sets and like depending on what the main theme of the BT sets like they definitely have room to be able to explore different design spaces and design avenues when it comes to different Digimon that could be implemented into the game. So yes, we do have a lot of Agumon. Yes, we could expect to see a lot of Agumon, but hopefully Bandai can get their stuff together and not make it so that Agumon.deck is still going to be the most played and supported thing and the top deck forever because nobody wants the same deck to be like topping forever uh as everyone has complained about with melga being the best for two and a half formats oh uh, yeah i mean we'll see we'll see i i i have faith that they can be creative and make even if they do make more agumons at least make them more interesting and different than what we already have than the next agumon dot searcher which literally all they did in bt12 was just make a bunch of agumons that search so it's, and they all search the same thing a greymon and then a respected tamer so it's like it's it's a little lame but i mean it's not bad it's just a little lame um so and bt14 shows that they're gonna do some interesting with the agumon and the, the level threes in general. So I, I have faith there's some cool stuff coming down the line. We just got to be a little more patient. That's all. Yeah, and it's not like every set we get an Agumon. It's more like every other set. I'm not going to sit here and count how many sets have an Agumon in it. Because I know it's already going to be a lot, if not more than half. Or at least half. But It's got to be about like, 70%. I'm not it, gonna lie. It is, yeah, it, it is just the nature of the beast and marketing and like just design and lore like there's just a lot of assets and fav avenues that are going into the decisions on why they need to make another agumon and why another agumon is popping up um and i think that they definitely they do have some misses and they do have some hits in terms of like figuring out good ways to be able to diversify the different tools that the same name is playing around with interesting ever i gotta I, I gotta do some more thinking and stuff about that because i i i'd like to like really think very hard about that topic and like give a little bit more weight into it because at the current moment i have like a baseline well it's just agumon so duh i know agumons gabumons we're just gonna see those over and over the, like the main lines of everything we see, we'll see over and over. Just because it's just that. But uh, I'd like to get a little more deeper into that eventually. Yeah, I always like I I come from a design background, so I always like looking at the designs of things and kind of like reverse engineer and figure out why and how and what like the the purposes of what they're doing and what they're laying out and why they're doing it like that that all is like fun for me to think about is just the as as a designer pick it apart and see what what's underneath the hood uh, as best as i possibly can with the limited amount of knowledge that i have and the experience that i have as well but i think that is going to be it on time uh, I want to thank everyone for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please uh, help support the channel by sharing to others on social media that we are on Twitch, YouTube, and Spotify and various other platforms uh, that host podcasts. And then on top of that, don't forget to leave a rating and review. That also helps feed the master algorithm for us to get more promoted and spotted by others just randomly passing by on top of the fact that if you want to also um, leave a subscription or a follow 
or however you feel comfortable based on the platform of choice to support the channel to make sure you get constant updates when the next episode goes live. That's always good. And with that, I hope everyone has a wonderful time and I will see you or will see you in the next episode.